Hello, welcome to the final session um, for today, which is on effective solutions. Um, I want to first of all introduce myself. My name is um, Sangeeta Chandrasekharan, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute based at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, the lands on which I stand right now, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulam Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present, and also to emerging leaders. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which you are, you and our audience, and also our university campuses um, are situated. These are lands of age-old ceremonies, uh, celebration, initiation, and renewal, also land and waters um, that have um, being the subject of um, Aboriginal stewardship, both cultural, sp spiritual, economic, for thousands and thousands of years. And Aboriginal people continue to have a very unique role in relation to these lands and waters. So today I would like to um, introduce this uh, topic of effective solutions. Under the Paris Agreement, we have a recognized need to follow science-based targets in order to reduce greenhouse pollution and also to build low carbon economies. But there's a gap between what countries and companies say they want to do and what they're actually doing. And we need to close that gap. And part of that involves generating and translating knowledge for climate solutions. We see universities as having a critical role to play in, in, in this, um, in developing and supporting these solutions. And at, here at Melbourne University, we feel uniquely placed to bring together leading experts from across the disciplines, from the sciences and also the humanities, thought leaders from a range of diverse areas. Through collaboration, conversation, dialogues like this, we hope to be able to deepen and quicken knowledge gathering and dissemination. So today we've brought together a panel with a wide range of credentials and expertise and insights to debate and discuss climate solutions in more detail, both the process for generating solutions and also the content of these solutions. We have experts in the area of um, sustainable business, energy systems, agriculture, green infrastructure, and water security. So we recognize the need to be both realistic about the challenges that lie ahead um, but we're also hoping to be optimistic about the capacity for large scale social, economic and political transformation towards better climate futures. I should let you know that this session is recorded. So please place your questions in the Q&A function. And um, we have a team of moderators who will send them through to me and we'll endeavor to get through as many as we can later in the session. The chat function has also been activated so you can share your thoughts with other attendees. Um, the chat function is visible to everyone, so please moderate your comments accordingly. If you'd like to live tweet today's session, the hashtag is hashtag UniMelb Climate Futures. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. So today, all the speakers are from the University of Melbourne. We have Professor Pierre -Louis, Luigi Mancarella, who's the Chair Professor of Electrical Power Systems. Associate Professor Ben Neville, who's the Gourlay Fellow of Ethics in Business. Dr. Natalie Doran Brown, who's a Research Fellow in the Primary Industries Climate Change Challenge Center. Dr. Claire Farrell, who's Senior Lecturer in Green Infrastructure and a Research Lead on the Woody Meadows Project. And Dr. Avril Horn, who is um, the recipient of the prestigious um, Australian Research Council Discovery Early Career Researcher Award. Um, and works extensively on water. So I wanted to um, open up with a question about challenges. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of the speakers, um, starting with Pierre Luigi, what do you think are the biggest challenges from your perspective to achieving solutions for climate resilient landscapes and communities? Uh, thanks, thanks Sangeeta. Uh... Just, just to give you very quickly some, some background, uh, my, my area, I'm, I'm, I'm in electro engineering, modular energy engineering, so I really deal with the uh, technical economy modeling of energy systems, looking at uh, 
investment planning, but also aspects of uh, security and uh, um, reliability. So uh, if I look at this kind of framework, uh, particularly from the engineer perspective, I think uh, that we, we, without doubt, uh, is that the, the, the issue, or at least the contribution we can make, uh, this point, uh, is we try to integrate more engineering with, uh, for example, socioeconomic aspects, which I know there are lots of discussions about it. There are lots of discussions about consumer-centric uh, design and planning and engineering and what you want to call it. But then this doesn't really, it doesn't really happen. So to me, the very first step is to, to, to acknowledge that properly and try to find uh, the, the right tools to, uh, to actually integrate more and more engineer with this uh, social, socioeconomic aspects. And I think this will come up more during discussion. Actually, I'm, I'm looking forward to elaborate a little bit more on, on some of these aspects. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, we'll go to you, Claire, next. Thanks, Sangeetha. So I work on um, using plants to make cities more livable. So how we can use them instead of grey infrastructure. So things like green roofs, green walls, the woody meadows that you mentioned. And really, I guess our, our worlds have kind of shrunk in COVID times and our neighbourhoods and the cities we live in have become more critical to us. And so in Part of um, dealing with these climate solutions, I think, is focusing on how we build cities to make them more resilient and also how we can uh, stop all of the issues that we have in cities contributing to greater uh, climate change. So things like stormwater runoff, the urban heat island effect and losses of biodiversity and stuff like that. Thanks. Avril, as a, as a water researcher, what do you think are the biggest challenges for climate resilience landscapes and communities? Yeah, thanks. So I think traditionally um, water resource planning and policy has used a really technocratic approach and we've um, adopted technical solutions and that's been very much driven by people like myself with an engineering background. And I think one of the main challenges we face going forward and, and perhaps our biggest opportunity now is that we, we need partnerships to occur across community and industry and government and First Nations where we're actually coming together and having a dialogue and uh, sharing our different skill sets and perspectives. And um, one of the um, initiatives I'm involved in at the moment is a, a CRC, which is going to um, really aim at helping um, make room for these kinds of partnerships and discussions. And I think what's important about that is that we need to, I think, reopen the discussion about what we all value and want out of our systems as we move forward. Um, and Part of that is then about acknowledging the role, instead of having this dichotomy between things like agriculture and environment, looking at the role that the ecosystem actually provides in, in helping our resilient communities and landscapes and all of the ecosystem services that we rely on. Thanks, several. Natalie Doran Brown. Thank you, Sangeetha. So my research is around uh, carbon accounting of farming systems, carbon neutral farming, and the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions from farm systems. So one of the challenges for uh, agricultural landscapes and communities uh, across Australia is the fact that we're dealing with so many different environments. So we have the rangeland systems up in the north, subtropical areas, the more temperate intensive agricultural landscapes in the south. And these various environments have uh, different needs when it comes to managing climate and uh, adapting to the climate as well. So on top of that, there's a changing climate, there's a greater variability in agricultural commodity prices. And combining all these things together, you end up with uh, a very complex system that needs to be managed in a way that uh, it didn't used to have to be once upon a time. Thank, thanks, Natalie. Um, we will be talking more about the complexity of these systems. Um, ben Neville. Thanks, Sangeetha. Yes, I'm, I'm from the Faculty of Business and Economics. So my work focuses on businesses and, and business leaders. And in looking at what businesses are doing, there's some really good signs at the moment that uh, leading corporations are now seeming to, to really authentically get it. And they're starting to stand up and act. Finally, you know, it should have happened decades ago, of course. 
um, but there's some really great commitments to transition by leading corporations and they're starting to use their power to lean on others to also get on board. But we're still being held back by the laggards, which is mostly the, the, our fossil fuel industry. And they're creating drag on the transition in the economy. They create drag on the political transition. Australia as a country is creating drag on global efforts, which is you know embarrassing. Um, and but this drag is created by a number of influences, you know, climate denialism, the influence of the Murdoch media, also the lobbying by the, the fossil fuel industry on, on government policy. But a more institutionalized challenge is the dominance of neoliberal economic ideology and uh, ideas about the purpose of the corporation being only to serve shareholders. So these are legally structured into our e economic system. Business leaders have a legal duty to look after the best interests of the corporation, which has been interpreted as maximizing financial returns to shareholders. So if you can't make a financial case for climate action, then you legally can't take climate action. You have to take the unsustainable option. So there's a legal and ethical justification for taking a narrow short-term focus on profitability. Now, globally, there's some positive movements on, on corporate purpose. The, the US Business Roundtable, which is the peak body of US business, they released a new statement on the purpose of the corporation a couple of years ago. And this explicitly stated that business should create value for all stakeholders, not just shareholders, and to protect the environment. And this statement was signed by uh, the CEOs of the largest uh, 180 odd US companies. Also the World Economic Forum released their Davos Manifesto 2020, which made the, essentially the same point. So globally, there are some good statements being made, which is the, the first step in, in change. And once the statement is made, then it can ripple out toward positive action. We just now need Australian business to follow suit. Thanks, Ben. Um... It's interesting when you bring an interdisciplinary group together like this, um, we hear a lot about the complexity of the systems that we're dealing with and also a clear identification that the barriers are more than technical. There's no silver bullet te technology or economic instrument um, that's going to fix the problem once and for all. Um, I'm interested in why you think we tend to focus so much on technical solutions as, um, as a society. And as opposed to addressing the complex needs of diverse and vulnerable communities in a climate changed world. And I'm wondering if you can provide us with some examples in your own work about how you've tried to address problems that are both social, economic, cultural, and technical. Um, what are some of the processes you've used and, and are there positive outcomes that you could share with us? I'm happy for anyone to jump in on this question. Please well, I can, I can have a go first, if you like, Sangeetha. So I, I absolutely think that's true. And maybe part of it is it's it's super easy for us, um, you know, as academics to publish technical solutions, you know, like they're compartmentalised, we have control of the situation and all of those things. And maybe that's the same for government leaders and things like that. But all of these systems that we work in are super complex and you have to bring in multiple stakeholders to get the solution to work and to be engaged with and to roll out. And I guess that's something with the Woody Meadow project that we've worked on, which is about increasing the diversity and resilience of low maintenance landscapes. So replacing things like Lamandra and Dianella that you see in those freeway plantings with something more diverse and flowering. And with that, the only way you can get it to happen is engaging communities, different industry groups, uh, people like the Department of Transport, councils and all these other landholders. So you couldn't do any of it on your own. And, um, and it's also increasingly important to hear other voices, um, traditional owners and other people that interact with landscapes and have that legacy of, of land use and um, engagement that you discussed in your introduction as well. Thanks, Claire. My, Avril. I might add to that by um, just in the way that we think about technical solutions, I think we have a real opportunity to um, the sort of traditional model of developing technical solutions is to come up with something and, and then to kind of look for an application. And I think um, increasingly um, there's a role for design-led innovation, which is very much co-designed and embraces diversity of the stakeholders who, who need the solution. And so we've been increasingly adopting participatory modeling approaches to the way that we develop the technical solutions where 
the stakeholders are involved both in how you conceptualize the problem and identify what needs to happen, but also in all of the modeling steps that actually help you arrive at your technical solution so that there's more ownership. And um, it's interesting in the Goulburn Flow study that we've done recently using that kind of approach, um, very early on in the project when we said to stakeholders, what do you value in the river and what do you want out of the river? A lot of the things that they identified were actually processes that they wanted. So it's not so much that they um, were had a particular outcome that they wanted, but they certainly had certain things that they wanted to have happen in the process of arriving at the decision. They wanted transparency in the scientific solution. They wanted to have a voice in the way that decisions got made. And I think recognising the importance of those process-based objectives and, and, and how important that is to people in building legitimacy for the technical solution goes a long way to making them have more impact. Great, thanks Avril. Um, going from water perhaps to electricity, Pierre Luigi, we're working on a microgrid trial in a regional area. What's been your experience of trying to combine the social and the technical in projects on the energy transition? Yeah, I, I would like first of all to defend the technical solutions <laughs> uh, that actually we've done and there lots of good things uh, for technical solutions the past 200 years, let's look at electricity. I think the, the issue, as, as um, uh, we just said, uh, is more about how you incorporate technical solutions in the system. And when you look at this, uh, we, we uh, in, in engineer, we frame this as system as still in engineering systems where you have infrastructure to bring together technologies. But uh, the issue is that in, in, re in real life, uh, the engineering system sits actually within the broader social techno economic system, if you want to call it like that. And there, there is, a, is this intersection somehow is, uh, is missing between the, 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 the technical systems, not just the technologies really, and, uh, and, and everything else. And as you were mentioning, Sangeeta, we are actually trying to somehow break this wall or bridge this gap uh, and looking more and more how we could provide uh, um, technical and engineering design that uh, uh, looks at actually the role of the communities, looking at microgrids and things like this. Uh, and uh, uh, we already know from past experience that actually the engineering solutions you will get will be, will be different. We worked in similar projects, for example, in, in Chile when we design basically a plan uh, uh, for, for the electricity system in Chile against the earthquake. And one of the big questions was, what is the role of communities? after an earthquake, and we actually create uh, a barrier towards the development of the technical solutions, or actually they can enable some of the technical solutions, what we call like negative and positive resilience in the case. And not surprisingly, actually, you, you find out then the engineering solution changes the moment actually you take into account what the communities could do, how they could help, and some, sometimes not help, but not because they don't want, just because that's how the system is. And similarly, we are doing, for example, design uh, electrification planning for Sarawak uh, in the Borneo Island. And again, we see that uh, the, the engineers of the local utility, they would like to sort of bring from above a certain technology solutions to the communities. And then we had uh, uh, in this, this project with the University of Manchester, you know, so, so the social, um, social, like so, social, uh, I say like, well, anyway, social aspects, colleagues, really, sorry, I can't, can't get down the right term, talking to communities. And then you will find out that actually what they want is something completely different. And again, the engineering solution would change and you find out it's actually much more effective to do, to do that uh, when, uh, when, when you listen to what the communities want. So I think, I think you know, there is there's lots of space to, to do good work there. And yeah, we're, we're moving towards that direction, definitely. Thanks. Natalie, you and your team are doing um, quite extraordinary work um, in the agricultural sector and at the farm scale. And you've talked about diverse environments. There are also diverse communities involved. I was wondering how you have um, responded to these socio-technical challenges around climate change. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, as I stated before, there, there are very diverse uh, systems in the agricultural sector. And uh, I mean, it's interesting the, the play between the, the technical and, and social measures as well when it comes to complexity, because I think um, I'll just comment on that first, that often the technical systems being easier to measure, sometimes they seem more straightforward um, to look at those uh, particular 
um, measures. Whereas if you have uh, a social, social issue, they can also be measured, but um, it's not as, as black and white as, for example, taking a measurement of um, the, the mass of pasture. So that's something that's, that's fairly um, quantifiable. Um, but when it comes to farming systems, uh, you need to combine uh, both of those things together. The complexity of the farm system comes uh, from integrating an, an environmental system uh, in with the, the social. So there'll be uh, farmers, human resources um, on the farm there. It's a business activity as well. So the farmer needs to understand something about economics and, and something about um, how to measure their various farm systems. And so um, when that's combined with um, increased variability, once upon a time, farmers had the flexibility to be able to make um, mistakes and for it not to severely impact on the farm's production and its economic performance. Whereas um, the margin for error has shrunk and you have this situation where there's the increased complexity and reduced margin for error, it makes farming much more difficult. And so therefore farmers need to find ways to um, insert some, some risk management into that system, whether that's scaling up, whether it's, it's changing or diversifying the system, all of these are related to managing a farm and managing the complexity um, that is within the farm system today. Um, but our farmers in Australia uh, especially are reliant on um, the environments here. We have a lot of dry land farming. And so the traditional way of farming would have followed a lot of um, the seasonal patterns, but these seasonal patterns are changing now. And so the growing season might be a lot shorter. The, the growing season might have once only been in winter and spring, but now it's also in summer. You might not have pastures that grow in summer though. And so all these decisions um, yeah, are in increasing the complexity of having to manage a farm system. Are there some opportunities in that, Natalie, for example, um, doing some risk management through um, climate solutions like carbon farming? Absolutely. Uh, farmers, even though the climate change effects are relatively new, um, farmers are used to managing variability in forms of drought and floods on the farming system. So um, they have a bit of a head start there. And then with the various climate policies that have come through, uh, there's opportunity uh, to implement some carbon offset schemes and uh, to um, potentially either sell the carbon offsets or include the carbon offsets into the farm system to produce a product that is carbon neutral or produced under low emissions environments. Thanks. Um, we've been talking about complex systems, Ben, and they possibly isn't a more complex system than today's financial system. Um, finance has an incredibly important role to play in the transformations that we need to see. I was wondering whether you could talk more about the role of finance and how that can flow through to businesses adapting their business models and perhaps um, acting more ethically as you suggested in the opening remarks. Mm, yeah, okay. Um... So yeah, the, the finance industry, uh, I think, is uh, you know has really come on board in in the last few years, and I think it's a it's a recognition that that money does make the world go round, and um, and so uh, the finance uh, sector has a role in in stopping the world spinning in one direction and making it spin in another. There there has been. Um, a, a focus on the, the opportunity side of, of new investments rather than um, uh, sort of stopping in investing in, in uh, you know, the, the current um, uh, ways that, that the climate may have been uh, 
may be being damaged now. Um, however, there's there's a couple of uh, uh, sort of elements to, to this. So, so one of the, the, the core um, contributions to getting the finance uh, industry on board, this is the, the, uh, the task force on, on climate related financial disclosures. So this was set up by the, the Financial Stability Board. This is a, a global um, level board. And so the, with the, the TCFD, so um, uh, investors need to, um, or, or firms need to, to understand uh, their climate risks, and they need to show, um, uh, to, to demonstrate the, these, these risks and, and, and show transparency to their shareholders so that shareholders can make better decisions. That's kind of the, the idea behind it. Um, however, this, this relies on shareholders then to be the, the arbiters of, of whether these firms are, are, are doing, uh, are making you know, su sufficient change in, in, in the right direction. Um, and, you know, shareholders, of course, will be still making their decisions through a lens of, of financial returns now and, and in the short term. Uh, the TCFD also asks firms to do a scenario analysis at different temperature levels. Um, and, and uh, so, you know, many, many firms are sort of going through this process. Uh, you know, my own sense has been that uh, these tend to be overly optimistic. Um, there is a, a sense of, of some level of business as usual still being possible at, you know, sort of three degrees Celsius um, uh, temperature changes. Even the, the Bank of England, which has been one of the, the most uh, progressive around the world on, on this, um, this issue. Mark Carney, who you know, was, was the head of the, the Bank of England a while ago, has been arguably the, the leader in, in the finance sector. Um, it's even the Bank of England, in, in, when they have uh, just recently, they, they um, been uh, suggesting firms do a scenario analysis, and, and this is to try and get a sense of, of the risk that there is in the economy. They said that um, uh, that at four degrees Celsius, um, some regions may become uninsurable, right? which um, I think you know the, the climate scientists uh, amongst us here uh, would would you know know that there's not going to be um, you know much of an economy left at all at, at four degrees Celsius. So there does seem to be some overly optimistic um, scenarios being projected. Um, so, uh, but also uh, in with, with the finance industry in Australia, it's been very much driven by um, uh, the regulators. So, um, uh, ASIC and APRA, uh, who, who regulate the, the finance industry, and this was uh, has been very much uh, stimulated by the the. Uh, the, the, the original work by uh, Noel Hutley, um, I think it was a, a QC, so back in, in 2016, he was asked to uh, make a, a legal opinion about uh, whether climate change is financially material now. And, and he came out and, and um, uh, you know, did, did the analysis and, and uh, suggested that yes, climate risk is financially material now, which means that um, corporations and investors do need to attend to it now. And um, so that's had uh, a really big influence uh, on the, uh, the finance industry. And one of the, the, the better, um, I think, outcomes of this, uh, we, we have the, um, the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative, which is a group of the, it's the, the big banks and a number of other um, leading financial institutions. Uh, they have now developed a, uh, a roadmap to transition the, the finance industry. Another interesting one is, is Climate League 2030 that's been um, led by Hester and a number of other, I think there's about 15 super funds, including Unisuper. And so they have committed to try and um, shift the, the firms that, that they are investing in to actually reduce emissions by 45% by 2030, which of course is, is um, more ambitious than, than the, the government has, has thought is necessary. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, it's a very dynamic space and I think really important to the work of um, Melbourne Climate Futures going forwards. Um, lots of um, grounds for optimism, but also like you say, the task ahead is, is significant. And I think universities have a really important role to play in developing that knowledge base through diverse knowledges um, that can inform scenario analyses and, and other such techniques that will flow through to business planning. Um, it's come up a bit, the, the idea of strategic partnerships and collaborations. 
Um, and I was wondering whether um, some of you want to talk about the strategic partnerships that have been important to developing climate solutions in your work and um, give us a bit of an insight um, into how universities can and should partner with external stakeholders for impact. I might start then, um, Sangeetha. So I might just mention about a project that Natalie and I actually are involved in with a few others, um, which is seeking to scale up regenerative agriculture to, to respond to um, environmental challenges in the farming sector. And we thank uh, Missy for um, some seed funding to, to get that up and, and running. And so uh, we are partnering with uh, the Central Victorian Regenerative Farming Association um, and, uh, and they are in turn partnering with a number of other organisations, including Paraway, which is Australia's second largest um, corporate farmer. And so that project is, is uh, attempting to, to assist the, 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 pro, uh, the process of scaling up by, by trying to bring in mainstream finance. And so finance needs an evidence base um, that, that Regen Ag will work, but with particular measures and metrics that's in their language. So we've put together a team of experts from farm systems, sustainability accounting and investing to, to work on this. So it's a, a really nice, I think, example of interdisciplinary um, research across the university. And Natalie, what would you hope to see as outputs from this collaborative research? Um, I would hope to see, uh, well, some good partnerships between industry and farmers and a demonstration of how changing uh, farming practices can have a positive impact on um, not just the profitability of farms, but the sustainability of those farm systems as well. And, and that might involve new methodologies and forms of accounting. Yeah, so it's, it's looking at um, implementing uh, some specific farm practices. And um, these, these practices are all, uh, it's not just about sustainable farming. So regenerative farming is more uh, making the landscape better than it once was. So not just sustaining those practices, but improving uh, upon the existing landscape. Thanks, that's a really important distinction that touches on the conversations on resilience in the previous discussion session. Avril, you work with um, diverse stakeholders. What, 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 have, what kinds of strategic partnerships have been valuable and effective in the work that you do on water? So I actually wanted to highlight um, the role of um, First Nations in managing water resources and I guess a, um, an aspiration for the water industry in terms of the role that they give to First Nations in managing water. Um, they, while First Nations haven't ceded their rights to water, they actually at the moment have a very, um, there was a recent study that they have a very limited volume of water that they actually um, own now in the system. Um, and the cultural flows project that a lot of people at Melbourne University were involved in really highlighted the importance for Indigenous people in having a, a voice in the way that water resources are managed and as custodians of the land. And I think um, when we manage our water resources going forward, this isn't going to need to be a kind of an incremental shift. We're going to need to make some quite transformative changes about the way we think about managing our resources sustainably. And I think we would do really well to take advice and, and be guided by First Nations around um, the way that they see and value water resource systems and, and live with the land in a way that's sustainable. Are there any positive regulatory changes you've seen on that issue recently? Uh, yeah, so in one of the earlier um, sessions today, you would have heard from Erin O'Donnell. Um, she's been working with the Victorian government, Mildred, um, and sorry, and Mildred, um, looking at ways of recovering uh, water and identifying entitlements that can be handed back to First Nations so that they can have some autonomy around managing um, and contributing to the way that those water resources are managed. So I think it's a... Um, 
it's probably a slower process than it needs to be, but I think things are moving in the right di direction. And I think for the benefit of, of everyone, the whole water industry. Um, a related question, how, how do we ensure, and this is for all the panel, how do we ensure that innovative solutions develop and diffuse so that they have impact for people and communities that are most in need and, and most impacted by um, climate change? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Sangeeta. And it comes down to what Natalie was saying too about demonstration. Like I feel that of everything we can do, I mean, we can write papers about this stuff, but the more we can demonstrate solutions that work, the more it's other people can view it and take it up and put it out there. But we really do need to be using tools like spatial analysis more to work out where things should go for the maximum benefit. So, you know, uh, street trees would be an example. So looking at the hottest streets, the streets that really need water taken out of them so that we get less flooding. And I think, you know, we can look at Western Sydney this week and see, you know, the results of those kind of decisions. And they need more trees because it's a hot place. And, you know, they're obviously having issues with stormwater flows from too much permeous, uh, pervious surfaces, uh, surfaces as well. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Yes, as a geographer, I can't hear enough that we need spatial analysis and visualization. Um, did anyone else want to um, comment on communities in need and how we design research and, and um, transform for those communities? Natalie, please. Yes, I just wanted to comment on this at a global scale because what we know is that uh, a lot of the more affluent countries are the ones that are emitting the most, but those that are affected are often um, the emerging economies. And uh, one of my projects or a couple of my projects is actually working with some developing countries and um, they're reducing the emissions from their agricultural sectors. And their emissions, like their total national emissions output is tiny compared with Australia or, or any other nation. And yet they are drastically reducing their emissions just so that they can have a voice in the climate discussion. And so, um, yeah, my, my point there is that we need to consider um, people that may not be as, or nations that may not be as economically strong um, as still having a very important um, voice when it comes to climate action. So, so are there ways in which we can, um, through climate change action, address other societal challenges? For example, are there other co-benefits in terms of addressing inequality or First Nations um, self-determination? Um, that can emerge um, through some of these climate solutions that we're talking about. Thank you, Tom. Maybe I can I can say something. I mean, I look again at uh, specific cases of, of projects, particularly in Asia, where actually you new technologies such as uh, again microgrids, uh, distributed PV with some batteries and all that, actually enable electrification of villages uh, in a much faster way than otherwise would happen with conventional solutions. So for example, you need to extend the uh, existing networks uh, to hundreds of kilometers away through forests uh, and there, there's flooding and all that. And instead, new technology is actually allowed to, to come there with a quick solution, brings electrification, and uh, suddenly the life of, of people in the villages change completely, lives of families and, and all that. This is all enabled uh, by this kind of technologies at, at the same time, of course, address climate change because they're effectively all based uh, on, uh, on, on clean solutions, but really it's all, everything else is really, I don't want to call it byproduct, but the side effect, the positive externalities are, are actually of immense, immense value in this case, I would say. Absolutely. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that? I, I might follow on just um, to continue with, with another very similar example, but just to sort of give it more of a business model um, bent. So there is a social enterprise called uh, Pollinate that has been working in India for um, for some time, and um, and so they uh, they sell solar lamps into the, the slums in in um, in various uh, Indian cities. They've now sort of merged with another social enterprise in Nepal as well, but. Um, 
the, the, the sort of the financial and business model that they have is that they use local women to, they call them pollinators, to go around and, and knock on doors and, and um, to, to do the door-to-door -door selling. But they also provide finance for these families who uh, typically would be buying kerosene each week, you know, with horrible um, uh, fumes, etc. And and in, in total costing this this family far more. And so um, they provide a, a finance um, model so that these families can then pay off the solar lamps in, in nine months. So it's, it's, it's a nice uh, blend then, I think, of, of a business model and a technological solution. Thanks, Ben. Did anyone else want to comment? Um, I, I feel as though we're talking about um, the opportunities that are um, implicit in this um, climate transformation that's underway. Um, I was wondering if we could talk a bit about crisis and opportunity. Um, crises like the one we've just um, experienced and, and is still underway with COVID um, could be another opportunity to reinforce positive climate solutions. Um, and we faced many crises, whether it be water, scarcity, COVID. I was wondering, based on your own research, um, whether you can share what, what you've learned from um, other crisis responses that might be relevant for climate solutions. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, yes, when I think about some um, crises, um, some of the islands in the Pacific face this quite often through natural disasters such as cyclones. And um, while the immediate impact can be quite devastating, in the aftermath, there are opportunities in rebuilding um, to introduce some more climate um, adaptations that will then help the communities and the farming systems to be more resilient in the future. Uh, so while the actual event is quite um, traumatic, there are some positives that can come out of it in the way that um, the area is rebuilt. That idea of rebuilding better, yes. Um, any other comments, Avril? Water is a perennial crisis in Australia. Yeah, so I think, um, I think that water is a really good example where a lot of the water reforms were driven off the back of the millennium drought. And I don't think many of those changes that we that we saw in that scale of water reform, I think a lot of the rest of the world looks on and in, in all that we managed to make such a rapid change in the time scale that we have. And it was the drought that enabled that um, to happen. Um, I think one of the things when we look at other industries um, that where I think probably the way we manage water in Australia um, we need a bit of a shift is to actually bring in the concept of risk into the way that we do things so we we can manage for the for the, what's likely to happen or for what's predicted to happen but whether we actually have strategies in place for what's unlikely but plausible and what we've found even during the millennium drought prior to the millennium drought it was only predicted with a five percent chance that that would be how things would unfold and so if we're busy managing for what's what we think is likely to happen we're going to miss that thing that's still possible to happen that we need a strategy for and really taking a more risk-based approach and developing strategies that are robust as opposed to optimal, I think will set us up a lot better for future challenges. I think that's such an important point to make about modelling for not just likely but plausible and, and possible futures. And, and given what we know about climate change, there's um, you know radical uncertainty about futures and we need to build that radical uncertainty into some of our models and that applies for water and energy as well and, and many other areas. Um, Sangeeta, can, can I just follow up on this because it's, it's obviously very, very interesting and it's particularly relevant to much of the work we've done on resilience. And actually I would like to just shift to, to Texas for a second. I'm sure that everyone will be well aware of what's happened in Texas with a huge crisis uh, in the energy market because uh, basically uh, the, the, the electricity system and the gas system basically fro froze down for several weeks. And actually that very clearly uh, tells us that uh, physics always beats economics. So we can't just keep discussing economics if we don't understand actually that there is uh, some physics. And in many cases, we do not understand the physics either. And, uh, well, climate change physics was 
you know, many of you will know much, much more than me, you know, but it's, it's so complex that you can just hide you know, be, be behind it. So what we're now learning from Texas is the fact that if you perform uh, investments based on the cost benefit analysis about this kind of, let's say, possible, plausible events, but so remote, they will always be wrong. Because the moment that the event happens, then there is no cost benefit analysis actually holds and people will, will die and, and everything else. So we, we really need to change the way that we perform our thinking in economics first. Let's forget this cost benefit analysis. Let's start talking about like risk-based planning and everything else. Uh, and we know that this is going to happen now in, in energy markets and in system design for sure, thanks to the crisis in Texas. I, I really wish you know, that uh, also uh, our, our policy makers and politicians will learn also in terms of climate change from this kind of crisis we're seeing elsewhere. Yeah, it's an absolute tragedy what has happened in Texas. I guess there's a tension there, um, Pierluigi, between these trade-offs of um, what might be called goal-plating investments for what are seen to be um, less likely outcomes um, versus cost savings in, um, in, in the short to medium term by not factoring in those, um, those what are seen to be unlikely events. So there are some trade-offs and tensions there, I think. Yeah, but, but you know, it's, this is old school thinking. There is actually no, no, no trade-off because you, you will always lose. Eh? If you don't, if you do not hedge against these huge risks, I mean, this is now well demonstrated in real projects. We have the mathematical models to do that. Uh, I think this is really, really like the old school that doesn't want to come now to realize that the world has changed. And there are increasingly new technologies that are small scale and modular that are better at, with flexibility and addressing these kinds of risks than yeah, and, big builds. And, yeah, I mean, we we know Batteries. that you cannot you can achieve sort of win-win solutions. The problem is that if you, if you want to achieve this in an old school framework again, yeah, you know, we never get it. So the problem is we, like, we need to change the framework and the way that we perform cost benefit analysis effectively. And then all these uh, new solutions and new technologies actually, they're already there. So they will come to the table and we, see, we will see there's no actual trade-off. It just can be win-win if we really uh, you know, ad address the problem in the right way. Thanks. Claire, I, I wanted to ask a, um, a question about nature-based solutions. We have twin crises of biodiversity and climate change that are both related but also distinct. I was wondering, reflecting on, on your work, how you um, grapple with both of these challenges um, at, in a very applied way. Yeah, I think it's, it's a nice one, actually, in the space that I work, because you work with plants and they're all different and they have different properties and they have different benefits. So by working out which thing you're targeting at any point in time, so whether it's a shade tree or whether it's um, habitat values and things like that, you can select the right plant to do the right job in any place. And of course, all of this scales up. So at a city scale, it's about um, having connectivity. So having places that organisms can move between and also having diversity. So you build resilience as well as giving more habitat values as well. But I just wanted to say something to the previous point too, that actually the COVID crisis has been really good to highlight the role of nature-based solutions in cities. Um, so, you know, like we're seeing our graduates um, getting jobs that didn't exist a year ago, you know, because councils are realizing how important urban foresters and people that can plan good green spaces are. So that's exciting. And um, yeah, look, I think that people working in this sphere have never been busier and governments are seeing it as a place to invest money to build jobs and build economies as well. So um, there's a, a silver lining there, if you like. There are so many opportunities with um, land care, caring for country um, in terms of um, job creation and economic benefits. Avril, you probably have some comments from a water perspective about um, all the work that needs to be done to keep our rivers healthy. Um, and you're right, COVID creates a, a, a kind of impetus and opportunity to do this and, and we need to see more of that. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I think is increasingly being recognized by a number of different 
governments in the way that they model managing water resources. And we're seeing this with the MDBA now in having local regional offices and realising how important local community is in actually playing a role in managing those ecosystems and environments and bringing them along in that journey. And to do that, really, a lot of it hinges on relationships and people spending time with each other and learning. And I think um, it, it, um, the model that people are moving to is actually having a lot of those offices kind of divulged around the rural community to allow that place-based activity to, take, to happen. Um, I was also, I saw that comment from Erin there around um, COVID and, the, and the, um, how these things kind of grow exponentially before we realise there's a problem. And I um, just wanted to, to say on that, the lesson from COVID, I think, for water resource management is that um, I think um, a lot of the epidemiologists have sort of said that the, the actual technical solutions around how you manage a pandemic were pretty well understood previously. It's a big implementation challenge and a challenge of actually bringing the community along with you and, and making change. And I think it's similar for water resources. I think there's a lot of technical solutions there, but we're talking about quite significant institutional changes and behavioural changes in the way that people work together and, and think about problems of risk. And I think those are the things that are going to pose a challenge for water management as well. Thanks. Um, so we, we understand the urgency indeed emergency of the climate situation and the need for rapid whole, wholesale um, transformation. Um, but there's a challenge here um, to, um, in terms of bringing communities into the conversation, having a social license to act, um, having bottom-up solutions being generated as opposed to um, top-down, full top-down regulation. I was wondering whether um, panelists have comments on on how we bring communities into this and, and what the role of education and communication might be um, in doing this effectively. I'll just make a comment to start with. I think one of the really um, big things about um, bringing the community along is to shift the thinking um, so that it's not just about building a social license, which is I think a lot where, where we think about participation, that's the kind of reason I think people go into it, but shifting the thinking to actually realise that by doing that and having that diversity of opinions involved, we're likely to actually have a better outcome and solution because we've actually got more heads at the table and we're learning from the local experience and knowledge. So it's actually a the advantage of doing it is much bigger than the legitimacy. It's actually better solutions and outcomes as well. Does it slow down the process? Does it have to slow down the process, I should ask? Um, so I, I, my, my experience on projects that I've worked in is, is in the early stages of, of these sorts of projects, it does slow down the process because it takes time to build up relationships and figure out who needs to be involved in the discussion and also recognising that different people will want to be involved in the dialogue in different ways and there's power imbalances and how you're going to manage that through the project. But I actually think um, in, in water resources through things like this, the organisations like the catchment management authorities, they, they are actually really spending a lot of effort in building those relationships over a longer period of time. And in the end, it will be a more efficient solution um, for having those relationships in place and, and having that legitimacy and better outcomes. Yeah, I, I really agree with that um, statement as well. I think it always comes down to relationships, no matter what we do and how we do it. And I guess it's fostering those relationships in the timeline of your career and your work and being able to draw on different people when things come up that you need a particular expertise. So in that way, the more you do, the less it slows it down. But it, it definitely at the start, it is a, is a big process. Any other comments? Maybe saying, Keith, I'll just, um, you, you asked about the question about um, sort of education and, and knowledge building. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we do need to be, um, 
uh, you know, sort of a, a bit aware that, that more in just layering on more evidence of, of the risk of climate change um, is, is, you know, only, only partially helpful. And, um, you know, whereas the, you know, the, the problem has always been political will, right? And so, um, you know, this is something that, that Bill McKibben has, has been, uh, you know, trying to, um, uh, you know, in, in tell everybody that you know this. This is this is a political battle, right? It's um, and you know, there's there's been a a group of. Um, uh, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry, you know, um, essentially that, that has been, um, you know, deliberately, uh, um, you know, in, infecting the, the political battle. They, they've been financing um, climate denialism. They've been influencing, you know, government policy. And, um, uh, you know, the, the you know, I think he says that, you know, that the scientific argument was probably one like 30 years ago or so, you know. Um, and it's not to say that, um, you know, it does seem like this this political battle is starting to sway and even we see um, signs now that, you know, the Australian government is, is, is making some more positive, you know, murmurings of, 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 of positive change. So um, in, it's, it's not to say that, you know, that the battle, you know, has, has been lost, but, but you know, we, we do need to, um, you know, recognise the sort of, from a critical perspective, what sort of goes on behind, you know, closed doors and, and um, you know, in, in the, the lobbies in, in um, or in the hallways of, of Canberra, et cetera. Thanks, Ben. Indeed, um, this is this is a battle that needs to take place at multiple scales. Um, if there aren't any other comments, we've got a bunch of really good questions coming from the audience, and I might go to those now, if that's okay. Um, so, Ben, actually, the first question really speaks to um, your your last comments. So, you've spoken about. Um, the Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. Um, and the question is, what is the role of government and what is the role of shareholders in, in taking corporate responses to climate change beyond simply reporting and actually making them effective in driving increased action in Australia? Um, and to your last point, how do we deal with these laggards without mandatory emissions reduction obligations? Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Ben, but others feel free to um, chime in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, not 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 easy. Um, I mean, the the relationship um, between uh, government and and business and and society, I think, is is quite quite crucial here. Um, you know, traditionally we've expected that it's government and and regulators that that govern the systems that that we rely upon. You know, including that business relies upon, and and so it should be government that. Um, you know, is, is setting the rules, um, you know, to make sure that it's an, you know, um, a level playing field and, and that these different systems remain healthy. But, um, you know, in, increasingly we have seen that, uh, you know, government is for various reasons incapable of, of doing so. And, um, in, and, and, but in response to that, we've actually seen business starting to recognize that they do need to, to step up and, and are stepping up. And I think in, including, um, you know, in the US during the, the Trump administration, you know, there, there were uh, US businesses stepping up, you know, the, the US business Roundtable statement I mentioned is, is an example of that. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned that the Climate League 2030, uh, you know, having this 45% target when the Australian government only has a 26 to 28% target um, is a very interesting one where, you know, business is stepping up to, to help govern these systems that they rely on, um, you know, when, when government has been insufficient. But, um, yeah, ultimately, you know, it, it does... You know the the sort of the, the share market system that that uh, we rely on ends up having you know shareholders being kind of the, the arbiters of of what goes on. So you know we we are relying on um, you know leaders like like you know the Hester, the superannuation firm. You know her, their CEO Debbie Blakey, who's having to to put her uh, you know her head up um, and you know to be potentially shot down um, you know we if you remember the way that um, ANU when they made um, uh, they announced that they were going to divest from from um, you know some of their um, and their investments probably five or six years ago and the they were just bashed for for weeks 
um, you know, so it does uh, require significant courage. But then, of course, we are, there's, there's a democratic gap here. Then we, we're kind of relying on businesses as well to govern these systems. And, and you know, the, um, you know, business leaders, you know, they're, they're not expert in, in these areas and, and they certainly, um, you know, haven't been elected to, to govern the system. So it's, it's a very interesting sort of stage of, of, you know, political development, but it kind of is what it is. And, you know, um, uh, you know, Robin Eckersley said, you know, we need all hands on deck, you know, and, and that's, I think, kind of what, what's happening. And, you know, next is we'll be throwing the kitchen sink at, at it. And, and, you know, so that's, that's, that's the state of play, I think. Yeah, Luigi, you're seeing um, energy companies making decisions to close coal plants um, for various reasons in advance of timeframes that our national government is supportive of, for example. Do you do you think that um, business can lead the energy transition without having these um, mandatory um, regulatory requirements? Yeah, I think I think this would be inevitable, um, Sangeet. I think uh, uh, the, the, the the businesses in general are understanding that the word has actually changed. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if you look back, uh, actually, we realize that. Uh, the companies that start investing earlier on renewable energy technologies, I have, for example, in mind uh, Enel uh, in Italy, that is like one of the main providers now, particularly in South America, also in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, their profits now, they are huge compared to other companies. And then you see that there is uh, on a global scale, a huge shift uh, between investment profits uh, on companies like sort of traditional companies uh, towards actually the new, the new companies. So I think it's just, it, it, it just inevitable and uh, we still need uh, re regulation and uh, policy to enable sort of right solutions, right architecture. But overall, I, I don't think that uh, there, there, would be, there would be a, a, a coming back. It's just like the direction is there and, and well, it's, it's good that it's there. I guess the, um, it differs from sector to sector. Um, Natalie and Avril, we've seen some quite, um, uh, dire warnings about the impact of cl climate change on water security, particularly for the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, knowing all of that, um, are you seeing the kind of transformations amongst irrigators and farmers um, that, are, uh, that, that respond to this? Or um, do you think that still more needs to be done in terms of these mandatory um, signals from government? Uh, we're definitely seeing changes uh, in the agricultural sector, particularly if you um, take farms like uh, dairy industries that rely on irrigation. Um, and you can see it even in the metrics um, and also the way that uh, the farms are run. So, you know, um, once upon a time when water allocations weren't so scarce, uh, dairy farmers would irrigate their pastures a lot more. Now they need to think, how can I get the most growth uh, from each millimetre of water that I either receive or, or purchase through irrigation? Um, and additionally, uh, so on the metric side, we used to look at how much pasture would grow or crop would grow, say, tonnes per hectare. Uh, now in those areas, it's tons per hectare per 100 millimetres of, of rainfall or irrigation water. And, and so there's a real focus on, on how to make the most of uh, what's becoming a, a limited resource. And there's, there's competition as well from other industries. So those types of farms that might be more um, profitable, have deeper pockets, like some of the horticultural industries, they can afford to outcompete um, other industries when it comes to purchasing water. So we're seeing that in, um, in the management practices of farms and also in changes to land use uh, across those irrigation districts. Avril, did you want to add anything? Uh, I was just going to add that I, I think it's interesting with water resource policy, there's a strange disconnect between um, the way water resources are managed and agricultural policy. They're dealt with quite quite separately. 
And I think um, in many ways, the um, agricultural community has been uh, much better at responding and, and at adapting and building in systems. Whereas the, the way that we model water resources more broadly and the recent Productivity Commission report has highlighted this, the need to actually start incorporating climate change um, into the way we make decisions in a more systematic way. Um, and, and linking that back to how the agricultural demands are going to change across the basin, I think will be a pretty important step. Thanks. Yeah, there are many areas where we need in sustainability where we meet, need much more integrated governance across portfolios. Um, ben, I'm just going to pick you up on the comment that governments are not moving fast enough. Let's just say some governments are and some aren't. And we've seen examples of um, really strong action at the subnational scale in Australia, at the national and subnational scale overseas. So the next question is for Claire Avril and others. Um, the question um, begins, some cities and councils are leading the way in reducing emissions, but planners are also allowing development in areas exposed to climate risks. Claire, you mentioned the floods that we're seeing in Sydney and, and New South Wales today, which is um, turning all our attention to these risks. What do you think are the most important changes we should be making to improve planning, to adapt to climate change, and also to ensure effective water resource management? Yeah, okay. So I'll say my comments as not a planner, so I might say something a bit ignorant. But I guess from my perspective looking in, it, it seems to me that planning is a bit siloed within local government and, and even state governments. So it can become an issue that the communications between different levels of the organisations that are actually trying to build climate resilient cities don't necessarily impact on the planners in those um, operations as well. And so that can arise to issues. And I think it's also how we train the different disciplines. Um, you know, that's probably getting better that now that people do a more generalized degree, they don't specialize straight away. So they're getting exposed to a lot more broader knowledge before they become their, um, their professional occupation. But yeah, look, it can be a complete issue that um, planners who are approving things, even like green roofs as a good example, don't actually know what they are or how they work. And so then you end up with things that should be good solutions getting approved when they don't work how they're meant to. So that that's a huge thing. And also planning overlays, you know, just being smart, you know, not letting money win out and going, actually, we can't build there and we shouldn't do this. Um, Avril? Um, so I think um, there's, there's this two aspects I'd sort of talk about. One is um, around the discussion we need to have about what we actually want out of our systems. And I think as the system, as, as things are changing in the future uncertainty, is actually going back to what it is that people want. And quite often we, we know, so in terms of water security, we might know we want 95% reliability, but we don't have a discussion about what people don't want. So what's, you know, how many years in a row would they handle restrictions? So they're happy to have those five out of a hundred years in a row. And actually the discussion about what we're trying to avoid doesn't come into the conversation. And I think with what we're seeing play out in New South Wales at the moment with, with dam operation really highlights that where we actually manage our storages for a dual purpose. We manage them for water supply. So that's Sydney's water supply. So we don't want to be drawing down the storage and then, you know, because then that means that everybody goes into water restrictions but we don't want to have the storage too high because it also manages flood risks. And there's this dual set of values that we're trying to manage for. And we actually need a bit more of an open dialogue about what the risks for those two things are and how we weigh those two values and trade-offs against each other. And I guess the other thing I'd say is that I think we actually need to bring concepts of uncertainty and, and risk into our decision-making dialogue a lot more and be a lot more open about what our uncertainties are. There's actually quite a lot of science around decision-making under uncertainty. And I think that can filter in a lot more to the way that we talk to the community and the way that we actually make our decisions in a structured way in the face of uncertainty. Yeah, Luigi, um, there's a lot of resonance with uh, the electricity system and, and reliability and uncertainty, which I know you've done quite a bit of work on. Do you have any thoughts following on from Avril? Yeah, no, absolutely. I fully, I fully agree. And uh, the, if actually the tools that, uh, that we are now using or we developed all come from the, 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 this decision-making and uncertainty theory and clearly indicate that, uh, again, back to sort of trade-off and cost-benefit analysis, that's not uh, 
working with averages just doesn't work. You really need to have a different approach to, to the problem that is more sort of, that, the, that is intrinsically risk averse, because this, this is the problem that so far we have like a perspective based on the averages that fundamentally is risk neutral. But when then when you come to this kind of events, nobody is risk neutral because obviously communities are completely risk averse, but even the government is completely risk averse. The only risk neutrals are actually some investors so that could in a different way uh, make, make money out of that. And again, going back to Texas, it, it is there that you, you start seeing the tension between the risk neutrality of the energy suppliers and all that, and then the risk aversion of communities and the government. And that again, somehow justifies the fact that it must be a regulation in government to, to, to basically change this kind of framework to make decisions because otherwise with sort of conventional cost benefit analysis, this will not, will not happen. But have, otherwise, yeah, exactly. We fully agree with what David said. Do, do you have any comments on the role of universities um, in knowledge generation and translation around this calculus of risk? and um, how university researchers can actually make a difference in these complex policy regulatory market decisions? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, we could definitely do a lot more, especially in this country. And I think uh, our capabilities are a lot more than, than actually what we eventually probably say or other people think we can do. Uh, I know, for example, that the tools that we have developed in this project with Chile are now being used to, by, by the system operator to plan the electricity system uh, against the earthquakes. So, so I mean, this, the scale, like, you can imagine the scale we're talking about. So, and they are completely different tools uh, compared to the tools that are, are used rest of the world for uh, conventional, conventional investment. We've done work now with the AMC, uh, the Australian Energy Market Commission, again, talk about resilience. Uh, and uh, some of these discussions are, are somehow uh, are, are understood then how you can change then regulation and all that, that's that, a that's, that's different step to make. But certainly there is so much knowledge that I think you, we have as universities. And again, I don't know whose fault it is, but definitely there could be more that we could do. Thanks. The next question is for Natalie, but others feel free to join in. Um, what research policy and partnerships are needed to achieve widespread plantings in agricultural landscapes and regenerative agriculture? Is there anywhere in Australia or globally um, seeing a step change in these practices and adopting effective policies that are reducing emissions and increasing agricultural productivity and broader environmental outcomes. And I'll, I'll go to Natalie first, and then we might come back to Clara on this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so agriculture has become a part of many nations' um, national determined contributions, which is how much they decide they're going to reduce national emissions by. However, very few nations have actually defined how agriculture is going to reduce their emissions. Um, so there's not a lot of um, policy in place um, that, that mandates um, planting trees. However, there's initial research, there's a lot of investigation because agroforestry and silver plant pasture are two very promising options in terms of offsetting greenhouse gas emissions because they offer a lot of co-benefits for farmers. So if it's a livestock farm, you get shade and shelter for the animals. Um, on cropping farms, you can get increased pollination by native insects um, and other benefits as well. So it's probably a difficult thing um, to bring in just solely through policy, but the mitigation options we find in agriculture, the ones that are the most successful are the ones that have co-benefits against them. So other than uh, reducing or offsetting emissions. And so planting trees on farms um, has huge potential. And some of the studies that I've done, um, one farm, uh, Jigsaw Farms in Victoria, they offset their emissions of an intensive sheep and beef property by 50%. 
uh, Tallahenny, which is a sheep farm in New South Wales. Uh, they sequester so much carbon that it's 11 times more than they produce from the livestock. And so there are very real possibilities um, for trees to have a place in um, the climate debate when it comes to agriculture and landscapes in general. But Natalie, do you see these changes unfolding in an, at an incremental pace or are we, um, are, can there be these kind of transformative step changes that the um, questioner is hinting at? I think there can be transformative step changes with the right amount of information available. Um, so we're getting a lot of inquiries from farmers on how to um, you know, how to calculate the carbon that is sequestered in both trees and soils. And so um, before those changes can be made, and this is another um, role of universities, uh, is in providing the information that farmers need to feel confident in changing the way their farm is, is set out. So I think with the right information, um, that transformative change could occur. Thanks. Claire, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I guess um, from a city's perspective, it is something that's happening with very progressive local governments. So the city of Melbourne, for example, they've now got a tool that you use when you want to build a development, green factor tool, and you in there you calculate how much greenery you're going to incorporate in your building um, site. So whether it's green roofs, walls, parks, trees, all of those things. And, you know, you get greater points if you have more of those things in your development. So with more of those tools and when they're linked to incentives and reductions in rates and those kind of things, you can get step change. But I suppose it may end up being driven from the bottom up with consumers. So we can see now that no one wants an inner city apartment with no access to open space. Um, and no real um, benefits for their lifestyle. So apartments that incorporate sort of park type um, developments will be more popular. And so therefore you'll end up with more of them. Um, but yeah, like there's always a driver to these things in different cities, you know, in the Northern hemisphere, most of it's around flooding in their cities. Our stormwater works a little differently in places like Melbourne. So that's not so much um, governing how we incorporate trees, but it's gonna end up being around livability and having shade and you know, being able to have your kids walk under trees to school and things like that. That's the stuff that's gonna drive change. Sure. And, and also that, that housing is affordable in a city yeah, like well. Melbourne, particularly <laughs> significant. Absolutely. Many people don't have choices about um, green space. No. Um, thanks very much for responding to those questions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to close with a final question for all of you, and I'll, I'll invite you all to respond to this. Um, if you had to pick one key action for building climate resilient communities and landscapes in 2021, 20, so this year, what would that be? And I'm happy to take um, uh, examples from Australia or internationally. What, what would be your one key action? And I might begin with Ben. Okay, well, um, yes, I mean, I've been talking about, um, you know, corporate purpose and, you know, statements on, on corporate purpose and even changing the, the law, uh, which I think, you know, are, are very important. Um, but I, I sort of want to get back to this other um, sort of big ticket option that, that seems to have dropped from the radar uh, that's, that's radical, but, um, you know, I, I, would, would, I think it should be on the, the list of possibilities. And so last year, the International Bank of Settlements, which is the, the peak body for all the central banks, they released their Green Swan Report, if, if you remember that one. So in it, they suggested that, that central banks should consider printing money and buying coal assets so that they can shut the doors, pay everyone to go away happily and stop the emissions but also remove the threat of stranded assets to the stability of the, of the whole economy. So, uh, you know, this is 
quite radical and, and there is a uh, moral hazard, but I think, you know, if, if we're getting to, to the stage where we are needing to throw the kitchen sink, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, that, that the, these types of options will be better than, you know, seeding the atmosphere or any other sorts of, of geoengineering. Great contribution. Thanks, Ben. Um, I will go to Claire now. Yeah, so mine would really be about increasing and improving green space. So putting trees where they don't exist currently and then improving the space we already have. And by doing that, there's so many things that you can address and just make people healthier as well. So it's, it's climate change resilience and, and mitigation and adaptation, but it's also making better communities as well. Biodiversity, better health outcomes, Absolutely. equity. Sounds great. Thanks, Claire. Um, Natalie. Uh, mine follows on quite well from what Claire said in that uh, I think biodiversity on farm systems is very important as well. And um, it has the ability to reduce risk on, on farms and create greater resilience. So if there are more um, species of pasture, for example, they have different rooting depths, they create um, a, a better soil carbon profile um, in the soil. And um, it's also associated uh, with greater biodiversity overall and um, a more resilient farm system. Thanks, Natalie. Over to you, Avril. So I'm going to keep with the same theme. Um, I think in water resources, we've created this um, dichotomy between um, economic and environmental outcomes. And I think we need to bring those two things back together and, and realise the role that our ecosystem um, plays in sustaining all of the other values that we have for our rivers. Thanks. And last but not least, Pierluigi. Uh, I think uh, that uh, what my, my message will be for, for communities uh, that, uh, although counterintuitive, that if they really want to make contribution to sustainability and resilience, especially they're equipped with low carbon technology like PV and batteries, don't go off grid. I mean, that is actually selfish behavior. Just stay connected to, and share your resources, share your flexibility with the rest of the system. It's like, again, it, it, it goes completely completely against what everyone else says. But if you look at the real numbers, you know, do the engineering on that. Actually, it is better to stay connected. It's more, uh, you know, it's less selfish. Uh, you make more money and you contribute in a different way to sustainability and resilience. Of course, you need to design properly. But I think you know, there is lots of, lots of work in there to, to understand the right trade-offs. But um, yeah, just stay, stay, stay connected and share your resources with the others. Thanks, Pierluigi. The grid is indeed a public good and a tool for redistribution in an inequitable world. So thanks for those closing comments. I want to say thanks to um, all of the panelists today. We've covered a vast array of um, issues and themes from complex systems, environmental, social, um, community um, involvement and participation, uh, risk, uncertainty, co-design, and, and touched on issues of equity and fairness as well. It's been a really interesting and I think very productive and generative discussion on, on solutions and the processes embedded in those solutions. I also want to thank the audience for engaging. There's been a great um, amount of activity in the chat as well as Q&A. So um, thank you all for participating, but do not go away. I'm now going to hand over to Program Director, Professor Jackie Peel, who'll do a roundup of today's events. And she'll do this in discussion with some really talented student ambassadors, the Wattle student ambassadors. Um, just before I go um, to remind you that Melbourne Climate Futures um, is a new initiative for the university. Um, this um, session, as, as with others, will be uploaded in the days to come. I'd encourage you to keep a look out at the Melbourne University YouTube channel and website. Um, and of course, have a look at that pursuit piece that I think has been mentioned at pursuit.unimel.edu.au. So um, that's, that's it from me and I'll hand over to Jackie now. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks very much, Sangeetha. 
Um, and what a wonderful panel session that was. Um, welcome also to our audience or welcome back. And as Sangeetha said, if you've been following us all day, you will have seen me popping up at the start. But for those I haven't um, uh, talked to yet in the day, my name's Jackie Peel. I'm a professor at the law school and also the director of Melbourne Climate Futures. And this is our final session of the final session and a chance to reflect on all we've heard across the day. It's been a really rich intellectual discussion with so many different perspectives. Um, I know in COVID where we're not allowed to have smorgasbords or buffets anymore in terms of eating food and sharing food, but in terms of the intellectual side of things, I think we've had a rich smorgasbord on offer. Um, here to help me reflect on the day today and what we've heard are some of our fantastic uh, student ambassadors and I'll just ask them to turn their cameras on now and turn on their audio. Um, joining me I have uh, three of our Wattle Fellowship Ambassadors. And I might tell you a little bit about that because like the Melbourne Climate Futures Program, this is a super new initiative. So the Waddle Fellowship is a leadership development opportunity for students uh, with a passion and interest in sustainability. And over the course of the year, if you are selected for this fellowship, uh, you receive access to training uh, through workshops, retreats and masterclasses and also funding to implement a community action project. And just to plug, applications are open for students until April 30. Uh, with the inaugural cohort of fellows commencing in June 2021. But I'm delighted to have three of our current student ambassadors with us today. Um, and if you don't mind just waving at the camera as I mentioned you guys. So um, first we have Harriet Deans, who is an early childhood teacher and researcher. She's based at the University of Melbourne's Early Learning Research and Demonstration Centre. She's got a really um, rich background that's included a Bachelor of Environments, Master of Education, um, and she's also worked on uh, an ecosystem curriculum for uh, preschool children. Um, next up, we've got Tim Shu. Tim's, if you don't mind winding, waving us at there, is the Marketing and uh, Communications Manager currently at the Yara Energy Foundation. Um, and in 2018, he established the Equally Young Writers Network, which is now their climate communications program to support climate change and sustainability communications for youth and students. He has a Bachelor of Environments and also a Master of Environment. And last but not least, Kimberly um, is what's called an agronomist uh, at Elders. And she might tell us a little bit more about what an agronomist does. She works in regional Victoria um, on sustainable agriculture and crop production. And she has a Bachelor of Science at the University of Melbourne and a Master of Agricultural Sciences. So th these students have all been listening in today to all of the different sessions. Um, and I thought we might just start by reflecting on each of those sessions and what kind of takeaways you took from them. So our first session of today was about driving the change where we're hearing from a range of experts about in 2021, what some of the key priorities for action might be. So um, I think Harriet, you might've been listening in on that session. What was a key takeaway for you from that first session of the day? Yeah, um, hi, and thank you so much for such an incredible event. It was great to uh, hear from such an amazing and diverse range of people. Um, I think, you know, for me, I, I sort of go under the United Nations years of, and this year is the International Year of Peace and Trust. Um, and I think that the morning session, um, to me, made me think of those definitions, really, and, and the term peace and how that connects to sustainability and how trust connects to sustainability, too. Um, so peace describes, you know, a state of friendliness, um, feeling free from disturbance, having balance, um, having silence, um, and trust describes, you know, honesty and justice and strength um, and, and being confident in what the expectation is. Um, and so I think those terms to me really do connect to the struggles um, and also the learnings from 
uh, climate change and have, I think, yeah, made me reflect um, on the disconnect that there is in so many areas. And this, you know, idea, it's a big idea, the climate futures. And I think um, emphasising the big in that is really important because, yeah, it is a future um, a topic and it really, it really does start, uh, I suppose, with the human element. Um, you know, a lot of the conversations that were being had um, really did talk, you know, about humans' impact um, and their attitudes and, and human knowledge and understanding and how, how that uh, does impact relationships with the natural world and all that the natural world really does provide as well. Um, and so that starts with education, really. Um, and so, yeah, ensuring that young people are provided with opportunities to get outdoors. You know, there was a lot of conversation about how important relationship is with the natural world. Um, and obviously in the urban space, that's really hard. And, you know, um, Kathy Oak talked about, you know, cities and how, you know, we should be optimistic about what cities do provide. You know, they do provide uh, lots of different spaces. We have the Birrarung, you know, we have gardens, beautiful gardens that, you know, from this last session talked about, you know, roof gardens and balconies and all of that too. Um, and so I think that time in nature is really, really important for people to develop, you know, empathy and and to maintain that optimism. I think that, you know, you've really, you, there, you know, it needs to be a sense of optimism when talking about all of this as well. Um, so yeah, but you know, every young person needs needs guidance, and that's where this this whole discussion comes in. Um, and it's about having you know role models and people around them that and positive experiences, um, as, as well as you know knowing the facts um, and being aware of all of the issues. So we really can't underestimate you know the power of all of this work um, and how it does come together really. Thanks, Harriet. That's a really good summary of some of the wonderful themes we heard. And I really liked John Barnett's quote where he talked about what we can learn from other communities that are really living with the climate future, for example, in the Pacific, and, and the need for courage, honesty and leadership. Um, you mentioned that we've also spoken a lot today with a sort of future focus, a look at effective solutions. And I think, Tim, you were sitting in on that last session where we were talking about some of the different solutions that have gone across from agriculture through to um, energy systems and in the finance sector. Just wondering what you took away as a kind of key message or something that really caught your interest in that session. Sure, thanks, Jackie. Um, so I think there's it's good that we're focusing on solutions and it's good that we look at examples of what works and what might be able to be translated or scaled. Um, but I think it's also really important to remember how we define problems and that we don't forget that uh, like the processes of co-creation and participatory planning and all these sorts of things, um, those are just as important, if not more important sometimes, um, because how you define that problem collectively or whether that's top down or bottom up can, I think, shape what comes out the other end as a solution. Um, so I think, yeah, that was something which I was reflecting on. Um, I really liked the, the comments about relationships. So I think, uh, so last year I was tutoring for a subject called interdisciplinarity in the environment. And a lot of the focus for that subject was on uh, the, the personal and interpersonal relations in research projects, but also in uh, solutions projects in practice as well. Um, often it's those people uh, connecting, how they connect, how they relate um, that can have a, an enormous impact on the success of a project, uh, whether or not a project even gets started. Um, so I think it, that was a really, really good uh, comment. Uh, and the third thing that was, uh, I like Ben, ben Neville's comment about um, what happens in the hallways of Canberra. So I think another area which a lot of people maybe tend to overlook is those informal spaces. So again, it sort of leads on from the interpersonal kind of perspective, but. Uh, if we, we can't discount those informal spaces because we know that they're actually really important, but I don't think there's been a, a way to bring them into our decision-making frameworks or understand how to co-create problems and define problems together, but also including uh, informal aspects of the community or people in power. So, yeah. That's great, Tim. I think we did hear a lot today, ideas around collaboration, around conversation, 
around making sure that we co-design, that we have participatory structures for understanding and framing the problem and, and also framing the solutions. And I, I really took that away as a strong theme of today too. Um, Kimberly, just turning to you, um, you maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about the work that you do as an agronomist. Um, but the session that you were listening in on, um, I think that was the one that was the, the resilient building resilience. And um, what sorts of takeaways you had from that session? Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Jacqueline. So my role as an agronomist involves supporting growers in building the best crop productively and sustainably. Um, and when I was tuning into this um, session in resilience um, and I was racking my brain throughout the day, like how can I incorporate that into ag and into my growers? I was just thinking that it's probably inherent in the profession and that farmers are at the mercy of um, factors that are outside of their control, like weather, like droughts and floods. And I think as an agronomist, part of our role is to you know, there's the day to day and season by season kind of issues that we have to look after in terms of like your weeds, your insects and your pests um, and making sure the inputs we kind of add to the crops are sustainable and we have integrated pest management. Um, but I think, you know, promoting innovation like ag tech uh, to measure metrics like benchmarking for soil carbon and kind of proving sustainability practices and measuring their successes is a big part of building resilience in the grand scheme of things within the agricultural sector. Yeah, that's great. I think um, you, you're all working in areas where already you're applying um, the learning and research that you're doing and, and working quite collaboratively with different stakeholders. We have talked a lot about partnerships and, and, and sort of collaboration throughout the day. I'm wondering about your thoughts um, on this issue of how research best plays with or, or talks to uh, the outside world uh, engaging on real world problems. So any thoughts that you either gain from the day or the things that you're seeing in your own work around how we best do that kind of connect the dots between what the knowledge we're producing, the research we're doing, and then how it operates in the real world. Just wave at me if you'd like to <laughs> intervene and I'll turn to you. I can go first if you'd like. Thanks, Kimberly. No worries. So in agriculture, as an agronomist, there are key bodies that kind of support the extension of research. Um, so say in Broadacre, there's the GRDC, and there's in horticulture, there's Hort Innovation. So what they do is there's research happening um, through university, say, and the results of this research, we try to apply straight away on farm. Um, and because... Uh, they could be new research or they could be, we do a lot of trials at work um, and we work with these extension officers through these bodies like GRDC um, to kind of disseminate the information available. And Harriet, um, did you want to add into that at all about the sort of ways you connect research with external stakeholders or, or real needs in the community? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was looking at the uh, sustainability survey uh, that was produced by the University of Melbourne before this, um, you know, event that happened. And um, one of the key areas there was, you know, what are the barriers um, and how can you overcome the barriers to be more sustainable? Um, and so I think, you know, pro, you know, events like this one that we've just attended um, and also, you know, new programs that are coming out like the Global Leaders in Sustainability, the Wattle Fellowship, um, those can be a really interesting way to see how um, you can promote uh, sustainability and at such a sort of um, grassroots level and at, at the students level too um, and how that can then inter, inter, um, connect with you know, industry, um, you know, I'd hope to see that those programs are promoted by, you know, the faculties and institutes within university and then outside of the university and um, have that participatory, you know, engagement with students and industry as well. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that practical, you know, learning has so much to offer. Um, and so, you know, that's where research comes in. It is a very practical, so, you know, type of, um, 
you know, in education really. Uh, so I think, you know, there should be more interconnection between research and then what comes out of that research, um, but also an equity that's provided, you know, across sort of all of the areas too. Um, and I suppose this is what, you know, we this is this event's trying to achieve as well, to try and make that um, appear, you know, so that everyone knows what, what is what is out there and what is being researched and and what outcomes can come from from that research. Yeah, that's definitely been the name of today to sort of um, elicit the breadth and depth of the research that's going on so we can connect up better with um, the needs in the community. Tim, you're already working effectively in a business, as I understand it. Did you want to tell us a little bit about what the Yarra Energy Foundation does and this question of how you, uh, in your own sort of um, career, connect up knowledge and research with real needs in the community? Yeah, sure. So uh, just briefly, so I work for a small not-for-profit, which is called the Yarra Energy Foundation. And we're based in Richmond and we are kind of like an independent subsidiary of the city of Yarra in a way. And our mission is basically to bring emissions down from energy, uh, primarily electricity and gas to zero as soon as possible and preferably before 2030. Uh, one example of our flagship projects that we're working on at the moment is uh, essentially a community battery network. So what a community battery is, it's a big battery that's shared by a lot of neighbors and it stores a whole bunch of energy. And there's a big problem at the moment because uh, solar penetration is rising, but not everybody can export that renewable energy to the grid. Um, essentially the grid just needs upgrading. So what we're doing is we've suggested uh, this idea of a community battery with the electricity distributor. So the ones who take care of the poles and wires uh, because they've got a big problem too, which is oh, that how they're gonna upgrade their system to keep up with the solar penetration. So rather than spending millions and millions of dollars upgrading their, their wires, uh, we've suggested, well, we've entered an MOU with them to say, well, if we decide to move ahead with community batteries with the community and local investment, what we'll be able to do is essentially soak up all that solar, which is occurring during the day, but it's not getting used. So it's basically being wasted. Um, so that project's really exciting. We're writing a grant application now to, to DELP, um, to Victorian state government, uh, and Essentially, it's bridging, like we've, we've got people from ANU who have you know, interested in this space. We've got City Power, the distributor. We've got community groups like the uh, Yarra Climate Action Now group. We've got local council involved and we're working with uh, state government as well. So, um, yeah, it's less research driven, I suppose, but it's an example of connecting a lot of different people uh, in that space. And we've also got consultants who are doing uh, energy and business modelling on the side. So not... Uh, university research but uh, consultancy research I suppose um, but yeah I, I think um, just picking up on Harriet's point uh, the the avenue or the opportunity for students so if there are any students listening I think uh, don't underestimate the value of your ideas I think there's an incredible um, opportunity to to get your thoughts and your ideas and you know all those hours that you spend writing essays <laughs> It doesn't just have to be on a, on a Word doc. Um, I encourage you to use those ideas, either send them to people out in the industry or send them to researchers and say, hey, I'm interested in this space. Can we apply it somehow? And that, that creates new space to spark ideas and connections. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely encourage people to, to be proactive with their research, whether that be you know, as a student or as an academic researcher or outside of university too. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to make because this is really such a new field in many ways and, and a lot of the research that's being done, either if it's in practice or in institutions, is tackling really new problems. So um, I always say to my students when we're doing subjects too, um, your, work, your work is at the cutting edge. Don't be afraid to put it out there and, and communicate those ideas. One of the other sessions we had today was sort of specifically thinking about careers and, and climate careers. And we're asking people to reflect on sort of what they'd done in their studies that they, they felt had been really preparing them for being able to engage in a, in a sort of climate related career. And I, I wanted to ask each of you, because you've done sort of 
slightly different pathways and uh, in different areas. If you reflect back to your older self doing uh, studies at the University of Melbourne, were there particular things or skills that you built through those studies that you think have been valuable as you've taken that forward in your career? And Kimberly, I might go to you first, if that's okay. Oh, no worries. Um, so my background, I did a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. Um, within that, within that degree, I did internships, and I really recommend students to kind of have a feel for what's out there and do internships. Um, it could be like a week long one. It could be a formal semester one through the university. Um, I worked as an ecologist and in contaminant land and water local government so it's a great way to kind of assess what it's like out there see what a typical day is like um, but I think personally what I found worked for me is I just found something that I was super interested in and it doesn't have to be something that you are the best at but it's something that gets you really excited so I personally really liked soil so I'm a bit of a soil nerd and I think as I was doing my master's options I figured agriculture was a multidisciplinary kind of pathway um, and it was quite growing when I did it as well and um, so it was pretty exciting and it still is um, to study uh, and that's why it shows ag and you know it, there's a lot I mean coming like my background now is ag and I think I'm gonna wave the ag flag here and I think to sell it to you all your prospective um, ag graduates is that there's a lot of roles available for graduates and students and that it's very multidisciplinary like you don't like I'm not from a farm you don't have to be from a farm to study ag. I have friends who did engineering that end up being an ag engineer you know I before working as an agronomist I work in finance for commodity marketing so if you're into two, if you're into trading and the business side of things or like the financing banking side too there's that available so it's a very um, great field to be in I really recommend um, you know, being open to that side of things too. Um, but you do need to have thick skin and ag and you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and moving around as well. So I live in regional Australia um, because that's where most of the crops are. And, you know, farmers are, you know, the most innovative and resilient and humble people I will come across, but they will tell it how it is. So you have to be just ready for that as a, as a grad. So I just disclaimer for that too, but it's great. <laughs> And, and Harriet, you're working um, both as an educator and, and also with young children whose who's minds you are shaping and building in the, in the work that you're doing. What did you find in the sorts of degrees that you did, uh, both um, in the environmental side and then in your education training that have been really useful for you in the work that you're doing now? Mm. Yeah, I think it's really interesting when you when you talk about education, you know, you have 13 plus years of schooling yourself, you know, and then tertiary on top of that. And we're always learning. And, I, you know, I consider myself a lifelong learner, as I think most of these people um, we've heard from today do. Um, we're constantly challenging our thoughts and wanting to, to know more. Um, I think the most important thing, uh, you know, for, you know, a young person growing up, though, is that connected thread. And I think for myself, you know, I was, I think I was lucky to have a a connected thread of some sort of, you know, environmental studies throughout, you know, each of those transitions I made in my education. Um, you know, you've, it starts sort of at the home, um, but it also is an underlying sort of innate passion, I think, as well, that comes with people. Um, but, you know, some schools don't have the resources to teach, you know, sustainability or outdoor ed or any of the sort of um, studies you, you want to do. And some teachers aren't passionate. So you, you sort of lack of the draw as to how you're going to be shaped um, and how your future is going to go. Um, but I think in, in terms of my first degree, which was urban planning, which was the Bachelor of Environments, uh, that really taught me a lot about trying new things. I'd sort of didn't really realise I was going to go into that field. Um, and then, uh, you know, that really challenged me to learn new technology and ways of thinking. And it was quite practical, which I really liked because I was a really hands-on or still am a, quite a hands-on person and a hands-on learner. Um, and so that was really great. And it, I think, you know, teamwork is such a important part of um, learning and 
you know, in, term, in terms of climate futures, teamwork and um, working together and collaborating, those are key skills. You've got to be able to listen to others' ideas. You've got to be able to take their, their knowledge on board. You've got to be able to build on, on their knowledge as well. Um, and you've got to really be creative about that too. You can't go into it, you know, any conversation about climate or um, sustainability or the environment with a closed mind because the, the world is constantly changing and so are humans and, and the way that we adapt and the way that the environment's adapting too. So, um, you know, it's, yeah, those sort of creativity and, and having optimism as well and, and being a sort of, you know, can-do person. I think you've got to have, you know, an open mind to a lot of the learning that you, you want to take forward and, and um, the growth that you can make. And, you can, you know, you're going to make mistakes and every, everyone does and you learn from those mistakes too. Um, but now teaching young children, I think it's, uh, it's sort of, yeah, I've gone sort of back to where I, where I began um, and they are, you know, the, the future we're talking about in this conversation. Um, and so I, I sort of have to be brave in the conversations I have with those children. Um, but as I said, we can't underestimate how much they know and they need to know about those the issues. You know, they need to know about all of the, um, you know, reliance on plastic. They need to know about, you know, climate refugees and consumerism, you know, all the toys that they're buying. But they need to also know about, you know, green jobs and um, that their future is, you know, a really exciting and, you know, innovative you know way forward and journey that they're going to go on so um yeah I think it's it's their their future and we can't hide it from them thanks Harriet I'm just reflecting on my own kids who keep telling me that they're being taught about a growth mindset which I think <laughs> means that when you fail at something you try again and, and you're open to new experiences and seeing those as an opportunity for learning so I think that really is important part of building resilience as we face um, a climate change future. Tim, um, one of the questions that came up a lot in the careers panel that we had in the middle of the day was kind of if you're if you're currently a student or you're doing your PhD or you're doing a master's, how do you make that leap into climate careers? So, I mean, what's, are there particular things that came across your path or that sparked your interest? That, that helped you make that connection? Because people really are interested in how you follow or get on these pathways in the first place. Yeah, um, really good questions. Um, I guess I'll just reflect on a couple of uh, my own experiences and maybe that will be helpful. Um, I just wanna yeah, reiterate as well, I think <clears throat> what Kim and Harry have said about challenging yourself is important. Um, and yeah, also just recognizing your own capacity and, and taking care of yourself as you do embark on those challenges is important too, because we're not all in the same position to be able to go out and, and take risks and such. But um, so the first job I got as a science communicator um, in the horticulture industry. Uh, so this is during my bachelor, I was playing piano for this, comp this organization um, in horticulture uh, and I go to their conferences and entertain them. And uh, what happened was, you know, I built some relationships and they uh, somehow, somehow thought that I could, if I could play piano, I could, you know, communicate hort research or something. Um, <laughs> but, but that for me was an opening. Uh, I was following things that I enjoyed. Um, I was building on relationships that I already had. I was putting myself, I was taking myself out of my comfort zone. Um, it's pretty terrifying to, to play music in front of people. Um, and that led to an opportunity um, and, you know, that's not a formula per se, um, but I think the lesson that I learned was um, follow your values, put yourself out there when you can and, and build positive and meaningful relationships with people. You never know what sort of opportunities might come um, from that. Uh, the second story I wanna share is how I got my job working as a communications officer for uh, a not-for-profit called ICLE Oceania. So they support local councils and a global network of cities taking climate action. So after my work in Denmark, I was working for the local council there. I found out about this organization, realized they had an office in Melbourne, and uh, I basically just did a bit of research and I wrote a, a letter, um, a little bit of handwritten stuff on there too. And I physically went down to their office and, and I, I couldn't get into the building. Um, I didn't have a security pass. So I, I sort of loitered around, you know, uh, not too suspiciously at the front of the building and then snuck in when some people left, found the right sort of uh, letterbox and dropped my little letter in there to the director or this um, regional director or whoever it was. Um, so yeah, can recommend that got me at least a discussion <laughs> and then through some volunteering, 
after that, I managed to get a, a, a position with them, which allowed me to get the role that I'm in today. So, um, you know, put yourself out there, uh, really, really go for the ones that uh, align with your values if you can, um, because, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable to recognize sometimes, but it, it can be very competitive. It can be um, a little bit brutal sometimes, but you can uh, compete in your own field sometimes if you create those opportunities rather than uh, maybe just going through like a jobs portal necessarily. Um, so yeah, just a couple of stories, which maybe might help some people rethink how yeah. they're approaching things. Those are fantastic lessons. And I'm taking away three, which is follow your passion, follow your heart, put your hand up for opportunities and also build meaningful relationships as, as ways to take forward some of those opportunities. And I think they're really good lessons for all of us, whether we're starting our career or, or getting on a little bit further in that process. Um, we've, we're nearly coming to the end of the session. I've really enjoyed having a chat with you all, but I just wanted to reflect as a final thing on the fact that when we are talking about climate futures, it's our present generation of young people and our future generations that are really bearing some of the major impacts and changes that we're expecting to see with the climate. And I know that weighs on many young people um, and I, I imagine it's something you might have grappled with yourself. It's certainly something I grapple with as I talk with my own young children. But I'm interested to think about as we sort of look to the future, what gives you hope and optimism in this area? So what, what gives you passion, um, compassionate and following your heart in this area to keep working that you'd like to share as a final thought for today about um, the importance of, of maintaining the faith in, in moving forward on our um, sustainable climate future? So, Kimberly, I might go to you first and then uh, we'll go through the other panellists. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, I guess I thrive on my little wins with growers. So, when a grower successfully produces a better crop with less inputs, that's a win for me um, because their success is my success. And I think that's what, I, what drives me till I wake up and go to work and what have you. And I think, you know, it's a very exciting field to be in and sustainability in agriculture is a, it's a growing um, like facet of the industry. Um, and, you know, you've got lots of players getting interest in, the, in that field too, like investments and yeah, it's all very exciting. But I think my personal win is when farmers do well, then I'm very happy about it. And when we do it sustainably, that's like an extra plus. Great answer. Tim, have you got, final reflections on that question? Yeah, so I think for me, um, on the side, I also run a, a podcast called Talking in This Climate, which the sort of philosophy behind that is to encourage more conversations about climate change. It's often a very silent thing that you know people don't feel comfortable talking about. So for me, what gives me that energy is seeing people talking about things that previously they may have felt really uncomfortable talking about and embracing some of that discomfort um, whether that be, you know, online, uh, on Facebook or in person uh, or, you know, comments that we get from our podcast, things like that. So it, it demonstrates sort of like Kim just said, those smaller wins where, um, you know, change doesn't necessarily happen at a massive scale, like instantaneously, like these sort of small wins and um, can give you hope because it shows that change is possible. Um, so, yeah, that's the one for me, I think. And Harriet, last but not least. Yeah, I guess it's sort of a like bittersweet one, you know, when when you see the um, Extinction Rebellion and then, you know, the school strike for climate and all of those um, amazing protests that do happen, um, you know, it's sort of a sad moment in a way to see that that's what, you know, people have to do to get the message across. But it's also um, a very powerful and um, moving thing to see um, within the media and to actually, you know, make appearance on the media and to spread the awareness in that way, um, I think is, is sh you know, sharing the voice of, of this, you know, generation um, and generations to come. Uh, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's sort of a, a sad, you know, hope, but it's also saying that, you know, people are standing up for what, what is, you know, the, the future and what should happen and, and trying to, yeah, to make, make that change and to ruffle a few feathers within, you know, the politics and the economics behind it all. 
Yeah, I absolutely applaud uh, young people standing up, all people standing up to say we need action on climate change. And I think we've heard so many times today that this is an all hands on deck challenge and everybody has a role to play. And just thinking about your little wins uh, uh, analogy, Kimberly, we also had a quote in the careers session where we were talking about being the domino, not having to be the, the complete solution to every problem, but focusing on your small area and that might have flow on effects for many other areas that you don't anticipate. So we're coming to the end of the session, to the end of the day, and I just want to thank our wonderful Wattle ambassadors uh, and you can find out more about the program I think that uh, Kimberly or others may have posted some information in the chat about where you can find more information. Um, this discussion today has been recorded and all of the recordings from the various sessions will be available on the University of Melbourne YouTube website uh, momentarily perhaps but definitely have a look for them tomorrow and you can find more information about Melbourne Climate Futures as we move forward with new events and new programs and new collaborations at research.unimelb.edu.au. Um, but thank you again to all of our speakers. Thank you again to our audience. Um, it's been a wonderful day and I hope you've really enjoyed the content and the discussions. That's a wrap from us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. See you later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.